it didn't say anything out loud this yeah, time. Yeah. It, it normally says, you are being recorded, uh, but didn't hear it this time. <laughs> anyway, <He> said, <laughs> after Jesus rose from the dead, one of the first stories that we run into in the Gospel of Luke is the, uh, the story about the two men who are on the road to uh, Emmaus. And Jesus comes up to them and walks with them, but in such a way that they can't recognize who he is. And they, uh, they look at him with sadness, and he asks them, why are they sad? And they, uh, they, they explain uh, what had happened in Jerusalem. And then Jesus uh, goes on to explain to them why it was so important for uh, the, uh, the the Messiah to die and how the Old Testament had uh, told all these stories uh, before and al almost so much as to say to these people, well, why are you why are you sad? You should have expected this. You know, he told you about it. This is the way it, it is going to go. And and nothing that God had planned uh, was was done differently. Everything went according to the plan that God had. And, and so they uh, got up and they ran back to Jerusalem and they gathered together the, uh, uh, the, the disciples that were there. And the scripture picks up uh, at, at this point and it's in Luke chapter 24, um, hmm, some, somewhere later in Luke chapter 24, I think it's verse 20 or something like that. While the two who met Jesus on the road to Emmaus were sharing their encounters with Jesus, they were sitting in the room with the doors closed because they feared the Jews. Jesus appeared among them and said, Receive my spirit. All of the followers present stopped in their tracks thinking they were seeing a spirit and trembled with fear. He held out his hands so they could see the fresh wounds uh, the followers realized it was truly him, and they rejoiced. But he scolded them for not believing what the women and others had told them, and he said they had hard hearts or hardened hearts. And then he asked, what is making you doubt? I think that's a great question. What, what gets in the way of our faith in, in our daily lives? What makes us doubt uh, why is our heart hardened, if you will? Um, could be experiences in our past. It could be uh, our, our thinking, our rationale. We start thinking logically. There, well, there's no way for this to possibly happen. Even though the Bible tells us with God all things are possible, we say, well, no, that's not possible. You know, and so we we, we get into our head and. Uh, and get in the way of, of faith a lot of times. The circumstances of our current situation, we might look at it and say, it's a mountain too high to get over. And, and we just assume that if it's too high in our thinking, there's no way God can, can step in and help. And, and so there, there are those kinds of things. It could be our sin that gets us to a point where we're not listening or not seeing clearly. Uh, some trauma that we've had in our lives and it's carried forward and lingers in our mind when certain circumstances show up. Uh, or, or just, and I, I'm sure there's a lot of people who just are dead set against believing. They don't want to believe that God is able to do these kinds of things. But hard-heartedness, really, if we define it, comes from... Uh, a lack of believing that God is with us, that he's in control of life, and that he can resolve whatever situation that we are in the midst of for his good. Uh, he does all things for his good and for, for our blessing. Uh, I read a, read a book a number of years ago called Do You Know What You're Thinking? And uh, it, it was a rather interesting book. It picked up on a... Uh, passage of scripture that says that in in the same way let's say do the old king james version because i got that in my head as a man thinketh in his heart so is he you know we we are the way we think in our heart and of course in the hebrew 
world. The, the heart was, uh, they didn't understand the brain, so they said the heart was where all of the emotions are and where all the thinking happens and, and, and that sort of thing. And so uh, as, as we think in our heart, we can now add our mind. Uh, that's the way we are if we make these choices. And, and this uh, man who wrote the book said that all we have to do all we have to do, they always make it sound so so easy, you know, it, it's simple, not always easy, but we, we realize that this is the way I normally respond to something, to doubt, to question, to wonder whether this could even happen. And uh, all, all we really need to do is stop and say, well, wait a minute, that's not the truth that the Bible says. The Bible says Nothing is impossible with God. He works all things for good. If I can change my thinking into God's thinking, then I'm going to approach life from his perspective rather than from my own. Now, again, that's the simple way to think about it. It's not easy to do that, but, but that's the, the process, if you will. Uh, we react mainly out of habit and... Uh, the, the premise of this particular book was is that every experience we run into, every reaction we have to it actually goes through our brain, okay? Uh, even though it does it rather quickly because our brain is triggered to this kind of habit, uh, we, we see something, we respond instantly, and, and then we come back out uh, with our reaction to it or the words that we would speak. We have these preconceived ideas that become habits within us and we quickly react. And of course, since our basic nature is sinful, according to the scriptures, then our natural thinking is opposed to God and his miracles. Rather than changing that thinking, uh, now that we know Christ, we realize that nothing's impossible with God. How do we then become people who look at a situation and say, God, what are you doing in this situation? How can we uh, see this as being good? How can we overcome the circumstances before us rather than instantly being defeated? And, and that's the, the goal, because if we get defeated, we get hard-hearted. If we get hard-hearted, we get in the way of what God is trying to do. Faith... You know, it's, it's funny, some of this came up and some of these things came up in the choir piece this morning. Some of it came up in uh, uh, what, what Ian was, uh, was singing, that sort of thing. Uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, uh, the conviction of things not seen. And, and I've told you before, I really believe that what that means is that the things hoped for are the things in our past that we hoped God would do something, and he did. And because of that, we can bring that faith into the present and look at the things that are yet unseen and say, I'm confident that God can help me in that. And so faith is that, that juncture, that moment where we say, I've got enough experience to say God will be with me, then I can step forward with the confidence of knowing that he is. In that way, we can believe beyond what we see. We can train ourselves uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit to trust God to be with us all the time, as he said. And uh, all, all we have to do is change our thinking. Like I say, that's simple, not easy all the time. Um, Jesus goes on to say to the people in the room, <coughs> listen, it's, it's me. Look at the scars. Touch me and know spirits do not have solid bodies or flesh. And he held out his hands so they could freely touch him. And the more they realized it was him, they replaced their fear with joy. Joy comes, real joy comes into our lives by knowing that Jesus is alive and that he is with us. Scriptures went on to say, he asked 
If they had something for him to eat, someone handed him a piece of fish, which he received and ate in front of their eyes. And then Jesus said to them, I give you my peace. In the same way that the Father sent me to this world, I send you into the world. And breathing on them, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. And it, in John's version of, uh, of this, he, he says something that just, it just jumped out at me, caught me off guard. I've, I've taught about this before. I really believe it, but I, I, you know, I, I was just caught off guard by it. It says, forgive others every time you have the opportunity and their sins will be forgiven. That's kind of powerful. And then he says, if you do not forgive, they will die in their sin. We have been given by Jesus the power, the authority to forgive others or to get in the way of their salvation. Rather interesting statement. I don't want that responsibility, okay? Even as a pastor, I don't want that responsibility. Okay, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I didn't grow up in a tradition where I would have become a priest and would have had to stand in that position. Okay, but that that's powerful stuff where we have been given by Jesus that authority to love and care for other people and forgive them with the same love that he forgives them. Thomas, one of the uh, disciples, was not present at the meeting. And when these people went out and told him, we saw Jesus and he talked with us, Thomas said, I have to see the scars from the nails in his hand and touch the wounds before I will believe what you say. What hinders faith? Ask it again. Were they overthinking their situation? Were they filled with too much rationalization? Uh, I think of Peter in the storm and getting out of the boat and starting to walk on the water and then all of a sudden the storm seemed too big. Wow. Look into Jesus' eyes. We had that great little song that says, uh, turn your eyes on Jesus, look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Learning how in our daily life to stop thinking the way we naturally think and start acknowledging him present in our lives, realizing that he is with us, he's in control, and nothing is impossible to him. And when we can do that, we're actually <laughs> living in the belief that he has risen from the dead. And that's, that's where I want all of us to be living on a moment by moment basis as we seek to follow him uh, wherever he might lead. So, um, and now let's sing 220.